All right. Hello, class. So um, we're going to be talking about topic 4.1 today and 4.2 and 4.3, but um, 4.1 start off. We kind of already looked at this in class, but it's just introduction to political geography. All right. I think the goal here is going to be to, right, to define different types of political entities, which we've already done, and uh, identify uh, con contemporary examples, of political entities, which isn't too difficult. Okay. So essential knowledge, just understanding independent states are the building blocks of world political maps and, you know, these types of uh, political entities. All right. So um, importance of uh, independent states, you guys. All right. So we know that country, state and nation, kind of interchangeable, um, you know, when, we, you know, think about it, generally speaking. But of course, you know, as we've defined and will define again, right, um, when we think of country, right, it's a general term, but state and nation are a little bit more precise. So independent states as building blocks, we know that, you know, states kind of vary at, 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 a, at different scales, whether that's uh, local, right, like the United States or uh, globally speaking, right, when we think of, uh, you know, a world map. So, you know, us as people, we reside in, you know, several units at once, like, you know, county, state, right, <laughs> the country, right? So like the United States, for example, North America, that kind of stuff, all right? So political administration units, right, differ, um, empire, nation, state, province, county. So independent states, right? These nation states, these nations, these states, these autonomous regions, so on and so on, um, basically make up, right, a map. And, you know, that's really the first part of this topic, which isn't too difficult to understand, okay? Um, of course, states, right, nowadays, right, largest political unit. So how many countries are there um, before I move on? Well, you know, USA, right, and the United Nations kind of identify, right, 195 states. Um, but something important to know, right, is that this, this number varies from country to country, right? So for instance, uh, some states, right, might identify Taiwan as an independent state of its own. Um, but, you know, those that might identify China as an independent state might not identify Taiwan as one. So it kind of depends what your purpose is in terms of um, recognition of countries, all right? And uh, we can see here um, a list of, of, uh, of states, nation states, um, stateless nations, right? Um, Semi-autonomous regions, right, of nations, right? That, that, you know, are probably, you know, could, could not be recognized by the UN, you know, but of course, um, you know, these are the, uh, um, the places, right, that are not recognized as, uh, as being sovereign, all right, at least to the UN, all right. Again, some might view Taiwan, for example, as kind of an independent state of its own, same with Greenland um, or Palestine, right, Hong Kong, right. Uh, some major examples. Okay. Anyways, that being said, um, let us uh, define a state uh, to begin. All right. So, a state, right, politically organized independent territory with the government, right, defined boundary, contains a permanent population, maintains sovereignty, right, over its domestic international affairs, is recognized by other states, and has an organized economy. So, it's, you know, most of the countries we think of, right, in the world United States, Brazil, France. England, Russia, South Africa, Australia, right? And these are all states, right? Boundaries, permanent population, sovereignty, recognition, and uh, hopefully an organized economy, right? So again, right, sovereignty, the right of a government to control independence territory, determine what happens, right? If the state is recognized as independent by other states, you know, it might not be considered sovereign. Again, Taiwan being an example, all right? Uh, now, the difference here with nation, a little bit different. Um, so think of a state as kind of a political entity, while a nation is kind of more of a cultural entity, right? It's made up of individuals who have forged a common identity through a shared language, religion, ethnicity, or heritage, right? So, you know, requirements, right, to be considered a nation. You share a common cultural heritage, you have beliefs and values to help unify, right? Claim a particular space based on tradition, Right. You have a desire to establish your own state or express self-determination, right? So when you think of a nation, um, so, you know, all states are nations, not all nations are states. That's the way I think about it. 
Um, so you can think of a nation, for example, as uh, you know, the, the, Navajo, the Navajo people, right? The, the um, Native American tribe, right? You could think of that as a nation, right? You could think of the Kurds, right, as a nation, okay? So nations are not necessarily states, but states are nations to a certain extent, right? More accurate way of talking about that actually would be, um, you know, looking at a nation state, which combines the two, okay? A nation state is basically a territory occupied by a group who view themselves as a nation and is the same as the, is the, same as the politically organized boundaries of the state they call their own, okay? So requirements, right, fulfill the qualifications of the state, right? And some examples for you, think of Iceland, think of Japan, Portugal, Lesotho, South Korea, right? Nation states are usually smaller, right? And it's honestly more of a concept, um, singular group of people. And, you know, this idea of a nation state first kind of um, emerged in Europe um, kind of in the 20th century, right? Uh, after World War I, when, you know, you had all these empires um, like the Austro-Hungarian Empire and dissolving and, and um, you know, all of the different people in there wanting to, um, you know, have the right to sovereignty, right? So you could look at this, you know, little um, Venn diagram here to help you distinguish nations and states. Right? Again, nations, think of groups of people that want, um, you know, the key word being here to express self-determination state more of an official country or official place, right? <laughs> and then nation state, right? Kind of one homogenous group of people. With Belgium, it's a little bit tricky. Um, there's kind of a, you know, controversy, right? Surrounding uh, Dutch speaking people in Belgium, right? But when you think of Japan and France as nation states, right? You think of, you know, Japanese people, French people, right? People who, who um, pretty much in agreement on their cultural background. Uh, multinational states, um, you know, basically, you know, uh, um, countries with various ethnicities and cultures living inside its borders. Um, Iraq, for example, is a, good, is a good one to look at, right? You have Sunni and Shia Muslims in there and Kurdish populations. The United States is a multinational state. Key word here being national, okay, okay. So you've got more than one nation in within a state, right? But usually there's one politically dominant nation in there. Um, another example is Canada, right? Run by English speakers, but you've got increasing autonomy towards uh, Quebec, so French speaking people. Um, Canada kind of, uh, you know, not, not too long ago, um, very historically speaking, right? Um, kind of announced itself as a bilingual, bilingual country, all right? where you've got the uh, Nunavut territory, I think I said that correctly, right? Um, kind of, uh, you know, or, you know, more autonomy for, for this territory. And, you know, you could kind of consider it a, kind of a semi-autonomous region, right? The uh, Inuit people, okay? Another example, the United Kingdom, okay? You've got, you know, Scottish people, Welsh and English, all right, all within this, all within the United Kingdom. Okay, so again, you know, one way to look at it, right? The United Kingdom, of course, Canada, self-identified ethnicities within Canada. I mean, if you were to look at the United States, right, it would be, it would be even greater. All right, multi-state nation, right? Um, state of its own, but stretches across the borders of other states, right? So I uh, didn't really put the requirements here, right? But it consists of people who share a cultural or ethnic background, but live in more than one country, right? So think of Korea, right? They, all, they, they would share, you know, most likely share cultural, I think, background, right? But, you know, different beliefs currently, right? One nation, two states, that's Korea, okay? Um, Hungarians, the Hungarians is another example. Most live in Hungary, but many also live in Romania's uh, Transylvania. And then you've got stateless nations, right? A group of people without a state of their own, right? So um, these requirements, again, I didn't put it here, so I'll say, right, people united by culture, language, history, tradition. Uh, many have um, their own political organization. Um, so, you know, Palestinians, for example, or the Palestinians, I should say, for example, right, um, they kind of occupy the West Bank and, you know, the Gaza Strip, right? The Basques in the Basque country in Spain, right? And they're kind of in Northeastern Spain, but also Southwestern France, and of course, the Kurds as we watched in that video, Native American tribes. 
Roma people. Hope everyone is gypsy. All right, so of course, like I was saying, uh, the Palestinians, you can kind of see their loss of land um, due to Israel um, gaining sovereignty, All right? Basque country, again, you'll see it kind of stretches across uh, Spain and France. And most people right in these areas would, would consider themselves Basques, maybe not necessarily Spanish first or French first. Right, and of course, the Kurds. Okay. And lastly, autonomous regions. Okay. Uh, these regions, you know, have people with high degree of self governing and freedom from, from their parent state. But usually, autonomous regions, of course, are within within states, but they can also be outside, right? Um, authority granted to geographically, ethnically, and cultural distinct areas, for example, the island, so in the Baltic Sea, so far, a group of islands. Part of Finland, they lie near Sweden. Most residents are ethnically Swedish. Um, and kind of the history here is, you know, they submitted a desire to join Sweden after World War I to the League of Nations, but, you know, now they remain part of Finland. Um, so, yeah not a militarized, largely self-governing entity. Okay, and a better example, right, that we looked at were the Native American reservations, right? Um, right, they have their own police forces, right? They, they, they kind of have some leeway when it comes to the laws. They can, you know, maintain their tradition and customs. Um, but then the question, you know, as we saw in that second video yeah, in class, right? How autonomous are they really? Because, you know, the history of the United States government and Native American reservations is, is pretty, um, uh, tumultuous, right? A lot of tension, right? And a lot of unfulfilled promises over time, right? So again, autonomous regions, they're given some authority to govern their own territories independently for the national government. Again, another example, Hong Kong, right? You know, to make it easier, <laughs> since we sure we've all heard of Hong Kong. So that's 4.1, really, looking at political entities. 4.2 is kind of looking at... Um, Trying to understand political processes a little bit more. All right, so a couple of uh, key words in this topic, much like 4.1. All right, learning objective, right? Explain the processes that have shaped contemporary political geography. So what we really need to know is, um, you know, sovereignty, nation states, self-determination, all of that has kind of helped shape uh, contemporary political geography, right, and still does, all right? and also explaining processes that have um, shaped political boundaries as well, right? Colonialism, imperialism, independence movements, devolution. We'll be looking at a few of these um, because, you know, nation states, independence movements, not super important in the grand scheme of things. Okay. So uh, let's explain the processes that have shaped contemporary political geography, um, right? Sovereignty, all right, the authority of a state to govern itself or another state, right? The, the idea of nation states, sovereign state whose citizens or subjects are relatively homogenous in factors such as language or common descent and self-determination, the process by which a well, <laughs> process by which a country determines its own statehood, forms its own allegiances in government. Okay, so these are the key concepts, right, that shape political geography. All right, contemporary political geography, all right? So um, something to know here is that states can sometimes be independent, but not entirely sovereign, okay? There is a difference between sovereignty and self-determination. Self-determination is just this willingness, right, of a country to determine its own statehood, while sovereignty is, you know, formally, like, you know, being your own state, right? Having that authority. Okay, so, you know, think of Cuba, right, uh, over history, right? Um, you know, they, and you could consider them sovereign today. Um, historically speaking, they have been independent. They had, did have the right to self-determination, but they kind of relied on the Soviet Union when it came um, during the Cold War, right, in terms of uh, economic assistance, right, in terms of, you know, having um, uh, political power, right, because they were allied with, the Soviet Union, which was on pretty much on par with the United States in the Cold War. Okay, a um, little bit blurry here, right? But again, I was explaining the whole, um, you know, the example of, of the former country of Yugoslavia, right? So during the Cold War, um, you had the, the Balkan Peninsula here, 
kind of in conflict for various reasons, which we'll get some of the we'll get into some other concepts later in in this lecture here. But Yugoslavia is an example, right, of, of countries you know having this idea of you know self determination and ultimately gaining sovereignty. Okay, we can see right that you know. Uh, you know, the ethnic people in the areas, Croatians, the Bosnians, Serbians, ultimately gained their own independence, right? So what we see here, this map today is a consequence of nations fighting for self-determination against outside powers and against their neighbors. So Yugoslavia failed to respect national ethnic identities, which is why there was, um, you know, independent movement, independence movements, right? So after the fall of the Cold War and I, or, <laughs> Cold War, after the fall of the Soviet Union during the Cold War in 1991, right, all these groups of people, Slovenians, Croatians, Bosnians, etc., right, asserted their self-determination and formed these independent states. Okay, and there are plenty of other examples in the world today um, asserting their self-determination, right, and wanting sovereignty. You got Catalonia, which we looked at, Greenland, Kosovo, because um, it's not recognized by, by many countries, uh, many states. Uh, you got Quebec, Somaliland, Taiwan. But of course, we know the issues um, with all of that uh, as we watched that video in class. Okay. So here's some other examples for you of uh, you know, states, you know, asserting their self determination and wanting to gain sovereignty, right? The Flanders region, right? Um, you've got Kurds, right? Wales, Armenia, Crimea, Sardinia, right? And uh, my bad here, Hungarians, right? So you can take a look at this, right, to see some examples and try to make sense of that. Okay. Cool. Um, so uh, now we're going to look at some, um, what is it here? Examples, uh, right? Colonialism, imperialism, independence movements, devolution that have influenced contemporary political boundaries. All right. We kind of looked at this in the last unit. All right, but essentially, you know, colonialism and imperialism, let's define it before we look into it, right? So colonialism, right, is, you know, the big idea here, the policy or practice of acquiring full or partial political control over another country, occupying it with settlers and exploiting it economically, okay? So one way of practicing that um, is imperialism. It's not really full on colonialism, right, imperialism, but it's part of that. Imperialism is just, you know, extending a country's power and influence through military force, right? Colonialism, again, right, is kind of, you know, establishing settlements, imposing values, both political and cultural. Imperialism is just, you know, expanding control through force, right? It's not necessarily imposing, you know, cultural values per se, right? So both of these allowed, uh, the, both of these policies allowed countries to gain economic and political power. All right. Um, so through both, right, there was more diffusion over time, right, as we learned, right, last unit through lack of languages and religion and governments, economic systems, but more importantly, political boundaries. Okay. So again, colonialism, imperialism, the driving force behind, um, behind uh, all of this for, for European nations, right. So old colonialism, um, you know, we can still see its influence in, you know, contemporary political jogger, or, yeah, political boundaries, I should say, right? So old colonialism is, you know, European states establishing colonies to promote Christianity, right? Extract useful resources, establish relative power, right? Those of you that have taken world history probably know that, that famous saying of God, gold and glory, the three Gs. So the major powers at this time, right? Really from the 1400s to the 1800s, you know, was, you know, um, the British Empire, uh, the Spanish, the Portuguese, um, probably missing one more there, the French, right, I should have said, right? So, you know, kind of all started with the Spanish, you know, colonizing uh, the Americas, South America, Central America, the Portuguese going into Brazil. So, you know, we can see, you know, the, the impacts of old colonialism today, right? There's a reason why we speak English in in, in uh in the United States, right, in, in Australia, right, because the English colonized, right, and Spanish, you can see it in Central America and South America mainly, right, because of the Spanish Empire, all right. 
so again, some of the some of the major players um, during that era, where you got the United Kingdom, they basically had colonies on every continent, right? That's why there was that famous saying that the sun never sits on the on the British Empire, right? There were the French, right, who had the second largest overseas territories in West Africa, right? Which is why, you know, French language, you know, was a pretty big deal there. Southeast Asia, right? They attempted assimilation, right? So most local leaders retained close ties with France after independence, right, in West Africa, and, you know, and, um, we can still see that today. But um, the big example I want to look at here is uh, new colonialism, or, you know, basically the imperialism of Africa, right? And this kind of all started, um, you know, in the 1860s, 70s, but really, you know, in the 1880s with the uh, Berlin Conference and the scramble for Africa. So it was basically led by, you know, all of the major European powers and they focused on controlling lands in Africa and in Asia. And, you know, in this meeting that they had in Berlin, right, they drew new boundaries for African countries, um, most of which remain today. Um, and, you know, sadly, you know, they didn't consider tribal or cultural boundaries and they didn't invite any Africans into the conference, right, for various reasons. Um, mainly one being cultural superiority and, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, racial superiority, right, being white. So, um, again, right, Europeans colonizing Africa was so that they could, you know, the Europeans could benefit their own interest, right, so they you know, they based everything off of, you know, uh, you know, basic geometry, right, latitude, longitude. And, um, you know, even when they colonized uh, Africa, right, um, the colonies lacked solid infrastructure and education and resources, and they depended on the Europeans heavily, and they still do today, and actually now China. Um, so, you know, because of this lack of consideration of, of carefully drawing out lines and boundaries, um, we see a lot of conflicts between nations and ethnic groups within the African states today. Um, you know, the biggest example is probably the Rwandan genocide, right? You've got two major ethnic groups there that kind of, you know, basically went into civil war. And, um, you know, all of that is due to, you know, Europeans, um, what's the word here? Not considering, right, any of the, uh, the ethnic groups. In Africa, okay. So a little little uh, political cartoon for you there to look at. You can see how Africa was split up after the Berlin Conference. Okay, and like I was saying, um, uh, you know, a lot of the issues we see today in Africa is due to um, you know the scramble for Africa, but um, you know ultimately. Um, I guess positive if you want to look at it that way, right, is, you know, African states ended up gaining independence, right, independence movements led to this, right, uh, the assertion of self-determination. So this happened after World War II, the 1950s and the 1960s, even until the 1980s, right, um, only 15 African and Asian nations were members of the UN in 1945, but now, you know, you've got 106 members in 2012. So um, boundaries of new states frequently uh, but not always coincide with former colonial provinces. So you could just, you know, look at this map here and kind of, you know, get a sense, you know, that not much really changed, right? If you look at, you know, where, you know, Congo is today, right? Belgium, right? Not much really changed there, right? What Italy controlled, you no, know, nothing really changed there, right? And of course, like I said, it's led to conflicts, um, many parts of Africa. All right, and uh, just a small note here on the remaining colonies in the world. Um, the US Department of State look, uh, recognized 60 places in the world um, that are, uh, you know, dependencies or areas of special sovereignty. 43 of them have indigenous populations, 25 have no permanent population. Most are islands in the Pacific Ocean and Caribbean Sea, right? So you got Puerto Rico, uh, uh, Pitcairn Island, I think I said it correctly, right? And also the US Department of State's um, lists, lists several entities as colonies that are not considered colonies by other sources. In other words, we recognize these colony or these places colonies, but other places might not. So for example, we look at Greenland as a colony, right? With a high degree of autonomy and self-rule. But um, for the Danish people, right? <laughs> the queen of Denmark is considered the head. All right. So 
um, kind of related to this is, uh, you know, uh, to independence movements and, you know, the right to sovereignty is, is devolution, it's this idea of devolution concept, right? Devolution is basically the transfer or delegation of power to a lower level, especially by central government to local or regional administration. Okay. Um, so also, so, you know, in other words, devolution is when central power in a state is broke up among regional authorities within its borders, right? Um, you know, you could think of, you know, again, Yugoslavia, even though it's, you know, it's not necessarily transfer of power, but more so, you know, um, let's dissolve this country and make new countries, right? Related to devolution is the another term, balkanization. It's, you know, the derogatory geopolitical term um, because, you know, the Balkan Peninsula, Yugoslavia, right? Um, for the process of fragmentation or division of a region or state into smaller regions or states are often hostile or uncooperative with one another. That's exactly what happened, right, with Yugoslavia. Um, anyways, devolution, some examples, right? Uh, we could see this in Catalonia today, right? As we were seeing there, right, Catalonia generates a good deal of money for Spain, right? Um, so they could afford to be sovereign, right? People speak Catalan there in another language, uh, Ossetan. Most speak Spanish, right? And then, of course, like I said, an example of balkanization is Yugoslavia. All right. Oof. Okay, 4.3, <laughs> another one here, right? Political power and territoriality, all right? So um, objective here, describe the concepts of political power and territor territoriality, right? As used by geographer, all right? I think I spelled territoriality there wrong, okay. So basically, some of the things we have to know here is that political power is expressed by um, is expressed geographically with control over people, land, and resources, right? And, uh, <laughs> right. And we can look at this through neo-colonialism, shatter belts, and choke points, right? And uh, we'll start off by looking at territoriality here, right? Connection of people, um, the connection of people and their culture and their economic systems to the land. All right. So territoriality. Right, try saying that fast three times, right? Um, essentially, it's a willingness by one person or a group of people to influence others or shape events by asserting control over space, right? So just think of, um, you know, uh, your room, right? Um, or maybe your favorite spot at school if you ever had one or your desk, right? If you're at school, right? It's, you know, think of yourself as, you know, whenever you're in your room, whenever you're at your desk, right? You kind of, you know, in your mind, you own that spot, right? Because you're sitting there, you, you're generally there most of the time, right? It's your personal space. Um, so, you know, you might even put your, you know, name tag there, or maybe you might put a sign on your door, right? To your room. And that's basically territoriality, right? Having, you know, ownership of a space, okay? Um, at a national scale though, um, you know, that's, you know, more of a personal scale, right? <laughs> But at a national scale, countries control their land by forming borders, right? And they establish a national identity in a variety of ways, whether that's their names, flags, and anthems, citizenship requirements, or special names to their cities. So like think of the Big Apple, right? New York City, okay? Um, and all of this is reflecting, you know, the connection of, pe you know, people, the connection to their culture, their economic systems, right? Political systems, so on and so on. So governments form around these spaces, build political power and establish sovereignty, which allows them to control their territory and protect it from outside interference, right? And again, gives people a desire for ownership over a defined space, right? So sometimes states try to claim land beyond their conventional borders into the sea, but you know, we'll be looking at that later on in this unit. Um, so one way, right, that you could kind of, you know, express this concept of territoriality, right? That, sorry, that states, how states express this concept um, is through this uh, other concept, right? Idea of neo-colonialism, all right? And it's basically the use of economic, political, cultural, or other pressures, right? To control or influence other countries, right? So more developed countries, right? To less developed countries, right? So it's basically, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Indirect colonialism, right? You're not necessarily, you know, forcing your way into that country or, you know, 
uh, laying claim or you know having control over people right um you're exerting a certain kind of pressure whether that's economic or cultural right to influence all right so um control over developing countries is exerted indirectly right we see this in many of the former european colonies right uh, we see this right even us the united states has come a critique right um our influence in latin america over you know if we look at the 70s and the 80s and the 90s or today in the middle east right we can see that in, we can see it in the cold war right all the proxy battles that took place in vietnam right or you know, in the korean war or in afghanistan right and we can see it today right by china creating the new silk road um and i'll state an example of that later on um, so again neocolonialism um states impose um uh or attempt to control resources outside of their territories, right? Using tools of trade, diplomacy, or war. Okay. So, you know, here's a political cartoon, right? Or a cartoon that I'll help you think about it. Right? When we think of colonialism, right? We think of somebody right, coming in and laying claim to the land, right? But with neocolonialism, right? Um, you know, you're laying claim in the name of, you know, economic growth rather than, you know, God of glory or, you know, whatever it is. Okay. So um, former African colonies, right? Um, even though they are um, sovereign, many of these African states, right? Uh, they do have economies that rely on outside investment and therefore they're vulnerable to excess influence by outside powers. I right? think of Kenya, for example, um, you know, they needed to replace an aging railroad infrastructure uh, to transport cargo across the country uh, earlier last decade. And in 2014, the Kenyan government agreed to pay a company owned by the Chinese government to build a railroad line from the capital right to this to another major city in there, right? And um, ultimately, that cost $3.8 billion. And, you know, ultimately, when we think of interest rates and all of that, right, Kenya is, you know, kind of in debt to China. So, um, you know, China is also making um, other, other um, moves in, in Africa. Right, in other parts of Asia as well. So in a sense, right, um, you know, you've got African, African states, um, you know, having economic pressures or uh, uh, to China. Okay. So um, related to um, territoriality here is uh, choke points, okay. Um, and now when you think of a choke point, uh, you're not thinking of like where food might get stuck and you, you know, start <laughs> choking, but um, similar to that actually, you know, believe it or not is, you know, when we think of a choke point in, in, uh, in human geography, we're thinking of um, a narrow strategic passageway to another place uh, that makes it difficult to pass, right? So usually, you know, we think of straits and canals, all right? And, um, you know, these can be sources of power, of influence, of wealth for the countries. Um, that control them. So a good example um, is the Strait of Malacca. Um, you know, the Strait of Malacca, uh, you know, to the name itself, right, is a waterway. Um, it's between Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore. And, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, a point, a choke point um, for which all goods shipped uh, by sea between Europe, Africa, Southwest Asia, Southeast Asia, right to East Asia pass through. So a stat for you, 2017, um, you know, one more than one quarter of all soybean, soybean experts moved through the Strait of Malacca. All right, and it's only 1.7 uh, miles wide. Okay, so, you know, blocking, blocking choke points um, can put global food supplies and other resources at risk. Um, most choke points today revolve around the transportation of oil over the seas. And obviously that's a vital resource to power our modern economies. Okay. And you know, the reason why water point or water choke points command the most attention and are a cause for international concern is because, you know, high volumes of crucial commodities pass through them. All right. I mean, think about it, especially the Panama Canal, right? You don't want to go, you do not want to go like, <laughs> right? around the tip of South Africa, right? That's gonna take longer, but you know, obviously going through the Panama Canal makes things uh, a little bit quicker. Okay. The Strait of Hormuz is another um, example. It's located between Iran and Oman. 
at the intersection of the Persian Gulf and the Gulf of Oman. And it's a significant choke point um, in global oil trade. Um, so uh, it's, um, you know, um, a tension point in the world today. Okay. Also related to that, um, shatter belts, all right? The territoriality and the quest for political power sometimes leads to instability in regions, right? And that's what's known as shatter belts. So it's basically when a territory is caught between stronger colliding external cultural political forces under persistent stress and often fragmented by aggressive rivals, all right? In these areas, states form, join, and break up because of ongoing conflicts uh, among parties and because they're caught between the interests of other states, you know, outside, more powerful states, right? Best example, Balkan Peninsula, right, Yugoslavia, right, during the Cold War caught literally in the middle between um, the Western world and the Eastern world, right, and the democratic world and the communist world, right, and also there were, you know, struggles inside, right, ethnic struggles inside, right, the Korean Peninsula is another example today of, of a shatter belt, right? The Kashmir region for religious reasons here, right? So there's, I mean, they're surrounded by China, by India, Pakistan, Afghanistan. You know, you can follow this link here um, for other examples and get a sense of what it means for a country to be a shatter belt. Or not a country, but, you know, or a state, but, you know, a region, all right? Cool. Uh, we made it to the end, you guys. Um, nice job. So I'll post this PowerPoint. You should be able to see it. Um, but yeah, uh, we'll have to look a little bit more into shatter belts and choke points later on. So we haven't seen the last of that. Okay. But up next, we're going to be looking at, um, at political boundaries, right? How exactly they're defined and, um, you know, the functions of, of them. So yeah, let me know if you have questions.